there's, there's just no such thing. Every, every sheep must have a shepherd and every shepherd must have sheep in order to be a shepherd. So, and that's just how Christ works. And Christ always, and there's never been a time in the history of the world where Christ never had a shepherd taking care of his troop and taking care of his flock. Even if you don't see them, they're always there. And the, the, but the time you always see them is during every great reformatory, reformatory movement. You saw Moses, you saw Cyrus, you saw Christ himself, you saw Miller, and you saw Jeff Piffinger. So at the end of the world, at the Sunday Law, you must have 144,000 shepherds guiding his flock all the way down to the second coming. Is everyone following? Amen. Amen. That's the, the 144,000, every one of them is going to be guides um, to, to make sure Christ's sheep reaches the harbor safety to the second coming. So by God's grace, if we're faithful, we can be in that number. But if we're not, we're still a part of the body. But nonetheless, Christ is going to have shepherds. He has to have shepherds. And by his grace, I pray that this will be understood. And I love how Sister Val ended. You know, she ended um, by giving us a lesson that the Lord wants us to understand that oil is always separate from water. Those who have oil in their vessel will always be separate from the world. That's just how it is. If, you're, if you don't have oil in your vessel, you're, not, you're, you're just going to sink in the water. And the reason why Noah, Noah rolled away is because Noah had oil in his vessel, so he rose to the top of the water. The reason why Christ could walk on water is because he's God. He has oil, so he could walk on top of the water. And the reason why Peter can join him is because Peter has oil, so he can walk on top of the water. Oil walks on top of the water. So those who have oil in their vessel will be able to walk on top of the water at the Sunday law. So if we don't have oil in our vessels, I guarantee you, you're going to sink. Your ship is going to sink. The only way we can ride this world is if we have oil in our vessels with our lamp. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no separation from this world. It's the Holy Spirit is what separates us from the world. So by God's grace, may he give us his spirit so that we will be separate from the filthy water of this world. Amen. Amen. So let us open up the Sabbath school with a word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you this morning for allowing us to gather peaceably, peaceably and freely, O oh Lord, in this short time of peace that America is affording us and the world. We know very soon, O oh Lord, we're going to be robbed of this liberty, for already we're being robbed. And Lord, we only have a little bit of time to gather oil and to gather strength to prepare, to prepare for the flood that's going to overwhelm this world. And only those who have oil in their vessel will be able to ride safely through those waters, never ever being contaminated with this world, because oil and water can never mix. Those who have the Holy Spirit can never mingle with this world. So please, O oh Lord, give us your Holy Spirit this morning. Please give us a clear understanding of your word. And as you make these things clear to us, O oh Lord, help us to yield to God. That's the reason you make things clear, so that we would submit to God. We need to submit to you. We need to submit to your way. And we, cannot, we can't even submit without you. We can't, even, we can't do anything without you. So please help us this morning. Bless us. And Father, I thank you so much for your holy angels that are here. We welcome their presence, and I pray that we will feel their presence. I pray that you will permit them to flap their wings scatter the darkness around us, and empty their holy oil into us, dispelling us of error. And Lord, I pray for, our, for those who are watching live, that you will bless them, and those who will watch this recording, that a blessing will be extended to them as well. I pray that it will be as though we're there before them and they're here with us, that every, no matter what distraction, they will not allow themselves to be distracted, but that they'll be taken in and held as if spellbound, O oh Lord, as these truths are opened up to our understanding. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look into this, the first part of our note is dealing with um, John 1, correct? Um, I'm going to need a reader for going through this this morning. John 1, and it says, um, in the, we, uh, I could quote this one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was who? God. It was God. All right. So right away, the Bible lets us know the Word is God. Amen. And the reason why I like this, there's a lesson that Christ is, there's many lessons Christ is trying to get us to get from this. And there's, one of them is, he's the king of words. Words belong to him. He has the right to give any meaning he chooses to any word he pleases. At any time. And at any given time. And, but, praise God for the promise, surely the Lord God will give no meaning until he reveal his secrets to his servants or prophets. So anytime God has a meaning, he's going to reveal it to his prophets. And the prophets, like shepherds, is going to reveal it to the church. And those who have his spirit will understand the meaning given to them. And those who don't have his spirit will call it foolishness. Is everyone following? Amen. So, therefore, God's word can never, ever be confined 
Because, but it can be confined. Why can it be confined? Why can it be confined? John 1 tells us. Because he came in flesh. His word has a limit, but his word has no limit. Because he's God and he's man. He has a limit for our sake, but his word also has no limit because he's God. Is everyone following? And those who understand him and know him as God, the word now becomes to them having no limit. They're no longer limited because they know that Jesus is God. Is everyone, on this, is everyone following? All right, let's give a, I want to give some practical examples. Let us, you see, once we reach the fifth day to fourth month, God is, Jesus is trying to teach us how to understand the Bible. The Bible cannot be confined to any man's understanding. It's broad, and when we know him as God, our understanding will also be broad. And I'm, I'm, I'm only teaching this because I know for a fact that before the Sunday law, every one of God's people will have a broad understanding of his word. Because we're going to war with an with a angel that has a broad mind. He has a broad understanding of God's word too. And if we don't have oil in our vessels, we won't be able to ride above the flood that he's going to bring in to try to drown the church. As long as we have oil, we cannot drown. Praise God. We can't Amen. drown. The oil will never go into the bottom of the water. It can't. Nature says it is impossible. So those who have the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for them to be deceived. They're not the, weighed down by sin. They're, they're not weighed down by what? By sin. Because the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Because mm -hmm. sin is disobedience. So if you have the Holy Spirit, praise God, we won't sink to the bottom of the water. This whole world is going to be covered by a flood. Not like Noah's day, but it will be covered by a flood. And the only way to ride safely is to have oil. So how does the oil work? It blows where it listed. It gives meaning how it pleases to help us to understand the Word of God. So we're going to take, take a little lesson from that. Um, just read on to the next one. Um, and I pray that by God's grace, the Lord would reveal himself to us this morning. In the manifestation of God to his people? Yes. In the manifestation of God to his people, light has, had ever been a symbol of his presence. All right, so you start right there. So what is light? A symbol of his presence. All right, light is a symbol of his presence. So I pray that God gives us light this morning. As I said... Um, Jesus is the author of word. He, he gives meaning to the word, especially the word of God. And now, as I go through this, Adam and Eve, I'm going to take that story and I'm going to just make this application by God's grace. Now I hope we can understand. Who's Adam and Eve? There's many answers. That about, who's Adam and Eve? Our first, Our first parents. All right. So Adam and Eve is about parents. Everything we learn about Adam and Eve is talking about parents. Amen. Who's Adam and Eve? First Again. government. The first who? Government. All right, this is where I want to. So Adam and Eve represents every single government on this planet. Yep. That's what Adam and Eve represent. Well, how are we going to understand this then? Let's, well, let's see what Christ says as I, as I was sitting here meditating upon. I'm like, Lord, Adam and Eve is about everybody on this planet. It's about homes and it's about government. It's about schools. It's about institutions. That's what Adam and Eve is about. Church, it represents every, wherever a human being is, Adam and Eve represents them. They were told to what? Amen. So let's go on. So Adam and Eve. Who was Adam then? Who was that? I'm a, before I do that, Adam is a symbol, as we were saying earlier. Adam and Eve is a symbol to represent men and women. Mm -hmm. They're a symbol to represent leaders and institutions. Yes. They're a symbol to represent the heads of governments and the heads of the home and the, and the help meet. That's to help the, the leader of that home or the, or the, or the government <laughs> operate properly. That's what they're there to represent. But Adam and Eve, I'm a, because it's natural, I'm going to just use a natural story. They were to be governed by the law of God. That's what they were to be. So every government, every home, every institution, every school, every church is to be governed by the law of God. They're all to be governed by God's law. They're all subject. As long as you're born in this earth, you're subject to that law that God made in the beginning. Everybody. The only reason we are not aware of this is because of sin. An enemy has done this. An enemy has come in and made men everywhere forget God's law. But that was never God's intention. God's intention was that whole, the whole earth will be lightened with his glory of a knowledge of his law. And before Jesus comes a second time, God is going to fulfill what he desired to do in the beginning. Make sure the whole world is lightened with the knowledge of his law. Is everyone following? Amen. That's how God is going to close probation. Because in the beginning, Adam was to fill the whole world with the knowledge of his law, but an enemy made that process happen a little slowly. That's all. He didn't stop it. It just happened a little slowly. But at the end of the world, we're privileged by God's grace 
to, end, to finish this work, to make sure that this, this prophecy is fulfilled the way the Lord intended that it was from the very beginning. So as you go on, so then who's Adam? He's who? Uh, representative of Christ. He's representative of Christ. Oh, Adam, is, Christ. Adam is Biden. He's That's who Adam is. Adam is Biden. Adam is President Biden. Mm -hmm. Eve is Congress. That's who Eve is. Everyone following? Mm -hmm. Adam is Biden and Eve is Congress. Eve represents, Congress is supposed to be the help meet to the president. Mm -hmm. Is everyone following? And the law that's supposed to govern Adam and Eve is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. Okay. And they're not to, what's the tree of knowledge and good and evil then? This, will, this one will never change. What's the tree of knowledge and good and evil? Judge. The Vatican. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. No nation on this planet is supposed to eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The Vatican City is the tree, is the government of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? It's Satan's representative. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Satan's counterfeit rival government to God's government. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. And paganism was it at first, but now it's the papacy. This is his rival government, and he's using this government to feed every nation the fruits of the knowledge of good and evil. And America was set up. How did God set up Adam and Eve? Where did God place man? In the garden. Okay, so what's America's garden? D.C. Praise God. Where's Washington, D.C.? Where did God plant the garden? In the heart. No, East. no, no. Eastward. So where's, where did God plant? Why? God put Washington, D.C. eastward on purpose. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. is in the east because God is trying to re is, is, is um, fulfilling what he did in the beginning. This is what he's doing. And he placed the man, the government, where? Eastward. He placed them in the garden. Mm -hmm. That's where he placed them. Then who's the serpent? And who's the serpent? Who's the serpent representing them? Uh, no, nah, no, nah, we're not using him to represent the Pope right now. This is still America. Who's the serpent representing? First of all, what does the Bible say about the serpent? And it was also, and what else does Jesus say about the serpent? It's the wisest thing. The serpent was the wisest thing that God made. Is everyone following? That was, that's what I want. It was the wisest thing. The serpent was wise. It had wings to, as an illustration of how wise, because it represents Satan. He was, he was wise. That's what it, it represented. The, ser the serpent is a supreme court. Is everyone following? It's a supreme court. Why am I saying it's a supreme court? What do you put in, what do you, who do you put in su the supreme court? Any average judge? Yeah. What do you put in? The wisest ones. Yeah. You put the wise, the ones who knows the laws very well. And that, and, that, and that can advise and make rulings on the law. But the, the, supreme, the, the beast, the, the justice, said what? That's how you read the law? Nah, Eve, you shall not what? Surely die. The law is not going to condemn you. Is that the beast made a ruling on the law that God made. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, what do they do? They make rulings on the law. That's what they do. And they tell you what the law, they interpret the law for you and telling you what, um, whether you be punished or whether you not be punished or the direction you should go or whatever. But the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court justices, just like the beast, is going to be what? Deceived. They're going to be deceived on, on how. And America, what are they doing as far as the, the gay rights? Where are they, why are they doing these things? Because of the ruling from the Supreme Court. They interpreted the law, and therefore, what, what happened? Eve and Adam go along with the ruling. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. They go along with the ruling. All of this is there as long as our minds is open up to understand that allowing Christ to explain the scriptures to us. The scriptures is not confined to any and anyone. And the Lord wants us to really, he, he has us here at the fifth day of the fourth month. He's really trying to teach these things to us if we open up our hearts and minds to, under, to understand these things. Whoever, want, I mean, I'm not ashamed to teach these things. If you go into your Bible, if what I'm saying is true and you go to study your Bible, the Lord will confirm it for you. How does he confirm it? He will improve the understanding or he will cut down the understanding. That's what he will do. He will improve it or he'll cut it down. 
That's what the shepherd does. The shepherd is the one who separates and, 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 and provides proper food for his sheep to eat. This is what Jesus is going to do for us. And we have to understand these things as we go along. So the next one, I'm going to, go, I'm going to give another illustration. In the beginning was the word. And that word represents many things. It represents a lot of things. We went over it before. In the beginning was the promise, and I'm going to use that one. In the beginning was the promise, and the promise was with God, and the promise was God. What was the promise? What was the promise? You shall crush the, the head of the serpent. The promise was God. The promise was God was going to become one of us. Yes, it's connected to that. That God was going to become a man and crush the serpent's head. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The promise was God. That God was going to give himself. That was the promise. That's what was made in the beginning between the Father and the Son. They had a covenant. And the covenant was Christ said, I'm going to give myself in order to save man. Now the whole Bible then will have to advance this thought. The whole Bible would have to support this idea if it's true because the Bible says the scriptures is of no private interpretation. So if this interpretation is correct, then other, then other prophets must give us some understanding of this promise that was made in the beginning. And I'm going to just choose this story because I believe everyone's familiar with this story. is, is David, Nabal, and Abigail because we're familiar. What was that story about? 1 Samuel 25. David, Nabal, and Abigail. I just want the, 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 some of the main points. Yes, he asked for yes. food. Amen. And he refused, even though that they had uh, constantly protected, protected his, shepherd, his men. Protected his men. Amen. Yeah. He was conversing and then, with them. And, uh, and they were about to, they were going to go back and, and uh, kill him. Just, yeah, kill him. Okay. Amen. They want to feed him. And what happened? And then um, Abigail met them and um, persuaded them not to engage in food. All right, that's what I wanted. I just wanted that, that part. Amen. You, you covered it really well. Yes, David did good. And Nabal desire, designed to repay his good with evil. That's what he designed to do. He'd rather bring evil for David's good. This is what he did. And as you go on, Abigail finding out about what Nabal did, she was impressed. I mean, she was moved by the Holy Spirit to go and restrain David's wrath. David was angry and David was coming to execute his wrath. That's what he was coming to do. And Abigail, as you said, persuaded him with... with um. With soft answers. She, she persuaded him with a soft answer to turn away David's wrath. What do we learn from that? Well, that's about the promise. Because Jesus went before the Father and turned away his wrath. But what did Abigail say? Upon me, upon me, be, be this sin. Upon me. So what did Christ say to the Father? Turn the same upon, upon me. me. Upon me. Upon yeah, let your wrath fall upon me. Charge me with the crime as though I'm the one that did it. Charge me with it. Amen. What did the Father do? Charge Christ with the crime. That's the promise. The promise is that Christ was going to be charged with the crime as though he was the one that ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As though he was the one that broke God's commandment. So he was charged with the crime. And man was able to go free as though he did nothing. As though he did nothing. So the whole Bible is designed to teach us, teach us all of those things. You can take that same story and teach something about the Sabbath. You can teach, take that same story and teach something about the state of the dead. You can take that same story and teach something about tithing. Because tithing says you're cursed with the curse. And what was David going to do? Curse Nabal. He was going to curse Nabal because Nabal was not returning the faithful tithes. He was not taking care of God's minister who took care of the field. Is everyone following? Cursed. So he was about to be cursed with a curse. He was. And he was cursed. And curse Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes, he was cursed. That same story can teach any subject in the Bible because the wind, the definition blows where it listed. The Holy Yes, it will teach. Go ahead. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Amen. It can David teach vengeance. Was not mind. allowed to. Amen. Execute vengeance. Execute vengeance. Why? Because he was not anointed to do that work. The Lord didn't anoint him to, to take vengeance on the ball. So I just wanted to go through that a little bit as we go into the shepherds. The reason why I'm doing this is to build up on the thoughts on the shepherds. So when we get to that point, it should have no problem with understanding some of the things we're going to say. We should have no problem whatsoever 
We're seeing Doug Batchel in the Bible. We're seeing Ted Wilson in the Bible. We're seeing Swinon in the Bible. We're seeing Romari in the Bible. We're seeing Rashad in the Bible. We're seeing Living Waters in the Bible. We're seeing Amazing Facts in the Bible. We should have no problem with seeing people in the Bible. Is everyone following? That's what God wants us to come to. Every living person on this planet is in the Bible. Every one of us. Every one of us. We're all in the Bible. And the Lord wants us to see it that way. We're represented by either the good spirit or the evil spirit. It doesn't matter. We either have the character of Abel or the character of Cain. The character of Adam before the fall, the character of Adam after the fall, or the character of repentant Adam after the fall. It doesn't matter. Every living person on this planet is in the Bible. And the Lord wants us to understand it this way because if we don't understand it this way, we won't understand what he's going to open up to us and we're going to call it foolishness. We're just going to call it foolishness. So can you read the next one for us, please? Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of, bo of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. All right, I'm going to stop there for right now. All right. So last night as we was doing worship, the Lord added this one. I like this story. I'm just giving examples before we go into the other one. Um, Adam and Eve, why do they need fig leaves? Why do they put on fig leaves? Why do they put on fig leaves? They were ashamed. They saw, so, okay, so the fig leaves was to cover their what? But what made them naked? What, what made them naked? How they knew they sinned? How did they know they sinned? How did they know? Everything around them changed. <laughs> Their conscience told them that they did wrong. Yeah, yeah, what y'all saying is right. But their conscience told them that they sinned. Remember, this is what Jesus is going to Who told you you were naked? Who told them that? Their conscience told them that they were naked. And they thought they can cover their conscience with fig leaves. Is everyone following? Yeah. They thought they can remove the stain of sin on the conscience by covering themselves with fig leaves. No, that's not how that works. That's not how that works. You can't perform outward acts to take away the stain of a guilty conscience. That's what that story is there to teach us. You cannot do outward things and think you can take away the stain on your conscience. Only one person in this universe can do that. They try to act in God's stead. They, what they try to do? Place in themselves in a place of a high priest. That's what they try to do. They try to do the work of a high priest, but they didn't understand the sanctuary service as yet, so Jesus can have mercy on them. Is everyone following? He can have mercy upon them. The Millerites thought they can cover themselves with fig leaves, but on October 22nd, Jesus had mercy upon them and showed them that, no, he's the only one that can take away sins. Is everyone following? That same thing is repeated all throughout time. All throughout time. Everybody, every day is almost repeating the same act. So what, the, what is the fig leaf then? The fig leaves is the thing you use to cover your nakedness, to cover your sin. Every time we commit sin, we all like to, the first thing we like to do is apply fig leaves. But Jesus, because that's our first instinct, is to apply fig leaves. Mm -hmm. But if we have the Spirit of Christ, our first instinct is to do what? Confess to confess your sins. Yes, to confess your sins. Your first instinct should be to confess your sin. If you still have the Spirit of Adam and Eve, and you didn't really receive Christ, your first instinct will be to cover yourself with fig leaves. In other words, to give yourself a reason to justify your nakedness. And therefore, it no lo if you do, once you do that, that sin no longer becomes sin to you because you now have a way to cover it. It no longer becomes sin. That's why Jesus had to stop that. He couldn't have fig leaves because that means that action will cease to be sin in their eyes because they found a way or they thought they found a way to cover it. They thought they found a way to cover sin. You can't cover sin with sin. Sin can't be covered with sin. Sin can only be covered with the righteousness of Christ. And the righteousness of Christ is a revelation of what Jesus is trying to do to save us from sin. If we don't get a revelation from God of how Jesus is trying to save us from sin, our sin is not covered. Is everyone following? Amen. If we don't study our Bibles to get a revelation of how Jesus hides our sin, our sins are not hidden. And you're trying to cover your sins by doing good works. Because the Bible said it's good to do good. So you do good thinking your sins are covered. No, your good works can't cover your sins merely. You need a revelation of the one who is the author of good works first and then do good works. If you don't have a revelation of Jesus Christ,
Before you do good works, your good works cannot cover your sin. That's what that story is there to teach us. It was good for them to cover their nakedness, but it was wrong for thinking they can cover it in their own wisdom and strength. That was wrong. You can only have your sin covered with God's wisdom and God's strength. That's the only way to cover sin. That's what that story teaches us. And it teaches us a thousand other things as well. Is everyone following? Yeah. It teaches us a thousand other things as well. All right, um, going on. So another thing you learned there, Adam was the shepherd. And the, that story teaches us is usually always the body that causes the shepherd to stumble. That's what that story teaches us. It's always the body that causes the shepherd to stumble. It's always the body that causes the president to stumble. It's always the body that causes the CEO to stumble. You see, Adam represents Jeff Bezos. He represents Elon Musk of, 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 of what's his company Tesla. again? Of Tesla. He represents Elon Musk and the board members is Eve. That's his board members. That's who Eve represents, his board members. And they're to, they're to be his helpmeet, helping him to run the operation properly. That's what they're supposed to do. But a lot of the time, the board members get corrupt and they influence the CEO to go in a direction that was not intended for the corporation to go. And we get into problems. And what do these companies do? Cover themselves with fig leaves. They cover themselves with fig leaves to hide their transgression, that they're not doing anything wrong, such as FEMA, what they're doing now in North Carolina. Is everyone following? They're covering themselves with fig leaves. That's what they're doing. I have a question. Go ahead. I would say, too, it's also the not only the body that causes the mind to the head, the to, head stumble. to stumble, but it also works the other way. We see that example with Manasseh. He, the Bible, he said Manasseh caused the people to, to sin and go to idolatry as well. And so it is in, in the health, in the body, the state of your mind can cause the body to stumble and be sick as well. Okay, now you're going a little bit further. It's always going to be the body. It's always going to be the woman. Manasseh's lower nature took possession of his higher powers. Anytime somebody sins, their lower nature takes possession of the higher power. Is everyone following? In that case, Manasseh is no longer a man. Manasseh is a woman. I, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Wouldn't he be rep Manasseh is also representing the head? But what, the but what made Manasseh do what he did? Satan. His religious Satan. belief. His religious belief is what made Manasseh do what he did. It was his religious understanding that made him do what, what he did. What I'm trying to say, religion is your lower power and the, and the civil is the higher power. Anytime a king is corrupted, it's always, she says, the, she says the, the, um, the destruction of a nation is due to his what? Religious leaders. It's always a religion that makes a nation get destroyed. It's, it's always the, the religion, religion that, that leads word, you to be destroyed. In that word, religious, yes, but also it says religious leaders, too. I'm yeah. saying both are associated I mean, with one. Just, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It will never change. That's, that's what I'm yeah, it will never change. Yeah, to explain it, it will that's never change. Yeah. It will never change. It cannot change. It's always going to be the lower nature that causes you to stumble. It always will be. It will never change. It, whether it be a man or a woman, it's always your lower nature that causes you to stumble. It will always be that way. It can't change. It tries to bring the higher power into bondage. That's how it always works. Whether you be a king or a ruler, you gave in to your lower nature instead of allowing the higher nature to, to rich his reason. Yes, amen. And that's what we start. That's why I started with in the beginning with the word. It's not, we must allow Christ to define for us these things and interpret these things for us because it cannot contradict the scriptures. It's always the lower nature that causes you to stumble. So you need to have your lower nature under control. And she says the higher powers is the kingly power of reason. Manasseh lost his mind. He was no longer a reasonable king. His lower nature was in control of all of his thoughts, his actions, and reasons. And he acted upon that instead of being the man that he should have been. He lost control of himself, essentially, is what I'm saying. Yeah, he no longer had self-control. That's who Manasseh represents. Yes, but he's the king. He's the king, but his lower nature was in control of, 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 of that man. Well, I hope that makes sense, um, nonetheless. Um, continue reading, please. Yeah. 
um, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. All right. So fig leaves wasn't enough to, to hide themselves. They hide their nakedness, but they couldn't hide themselves from God. Yeah, they couldn't hide from God. You know, you can hide from the fig leaves, but you can't hide, you can't hide from God. There was something I wanted to say to that in there, but it, it slipped my mind. And I'm going to leave it for right now. But back to the, um, did you read the part where it says the Lord called them? No. All right, just read that part, and we're going to go down to the next one. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I thought he covered himself. I thought he covered himself. Why would he tell God that he was naked if he covered himself? Then what is Adam talking about? He covered himself. So why is he telling God that he's naked if he covered himself? He something is something is telling him he's still naked. He knew he couldn't hide. What? He knew he couldn't because hide. God was speaking to his what? His, his conscience. His conscience. The Lord was speaking to his conscience. Yeah. Adam knew he was covered. The Bible says he covered his nakedness, but he told Christ that he's still naked. Mm -hmm. So something was telling him that he's still naked. Something was telling him he's still naked. But what was the problem? There was a problem because Christ is coming to solve the problem. Remember, they're the first ones. So what was the problem? They didn't know that God provided them a covering. They didn't know that there was a gospel. They didn't know. They didn't know that there was a covering that God has made for them because Christ was coming to tell them what or give them what? That covering. Mm -hmm. He was coming to cover their nakedness. That's what Christ was coming to do. But in their minds, what was in their minds? We're going to die. Sin. Yeah, we're going to die. The only thing they knew was that they were going to die. That's all they knew. Christ is the day thou eatest or thou shalt surely die. They didn't really know what death was. Um, and this is what Ellen White says. He didn't know what death was. She was inquisitive to know what death was. And she went to go get her answer of what death was from the serpent. So, and this is what many people are going to do at the end of the world. They're going to speak to the dead to get all their education from the, from the serpent. That's what people are going to do. They're going to repeat what Eve did. They're going to talk to the dead and allow the dead to tell them what death means instead of going to the Bible and allowing the Bible to tell you what death means. This, this is what many people are going to do at, at the end of the world. But the whole point is Christ came to introduce the gospel. That's what Christ came to do. They didn't know of it. But Christ came to, came to introduce it to them, and it's very interesting that the Bible puts in there to help us understand. And the Lord God called Adam. He called him. Can you read the next one on the voice, please? Called Adam. First Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, thank you. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to, obtain, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so what is the, every time you preach the gospel, what are you doing? Calling. You're calling. So the, why does the Bible say the Lord God called what? Called Adam. Who's Adam a symbol of? We said earlier. Adam is every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. In all, in Adam, what? All sinned. So when Christ called Adam, who's he calling? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. He's calling them to do what? Repent ye and do what? Believe the gospel. That's what Christ was doing right there in Genesis chapter 3. He, Christ was the first one to give the gospel call to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Is everyone following? Amen. Adam and Eve lost the fear of God. That's what they lost. And Christ came with the first angel's message to put back into their hearts the fear of God to do what? The fear of God. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? Keep his, Keep his commandments. Adam and Eve, because they lost that fear, the gospel came to give them back that fear. That's what it came to do. Christ was the first one to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. My brothers and sisters, we're represented in Adam. Amen. Every one of us. Amen. And Christ, when Christ preached to Adam, he was preaching to us. Amen. We are Adam. We are Adam. We're either going to repent or we're going to continue in our transgression to cover ourselves with our false reasoning and think that will be sufficient enough to hide from God. We cannot, you may be able to hide from me, but you can't hide, we can't hide from God. We can't hide from him. And the Lord is always going to reveal himself. But I want us to notice something else. We're going to jump 
I think I jumped over one with Genesis 45, right? I jumped over one in Genesis 45. No. Uh, she didn't put it in there. Just, um, it's, it's not in here. Go to your Bible, Genesis 45, and if you can read verse 3. I just want to bring in something of presence. Now, the Bible says um, Adam hid himself from the voice of God. They wanted to hide themselves from the presence. They wanted to hide themselves from the light. What, what light were they trying to hide themselves from? The light of the gospel. The commencement of the chain of truth. Amen. That's what they were hiding themselves from. Amen. Christ was coming to convict them of sin, the law, mm -hmm. convict them of righteousness, mm -hmm. salvation through him, and to convict them of judgment, the blessing that he's coming to give them at the end of the judgment. Amen. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. Adam was hiding himself from the commencement of the chain of truth mm -hmm. because yes. Adam represents Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world who's hiding themselves from the commencement of the chain of truth mm -hmm. and using fig leaves to cover this nakedness that they don't don't understand the plan of salvation. Jesus. They don't really oh, understand. Man. And naked. Mm -hmm. And naked. What do they believe? Every single Christian on this planet believes that good works is going to take them to heaven. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve did a good work. It was a good work. It was good to cover nakedness. Mm -hmm. It's good to, if you're naked, cover yourself. Mm -hmm. So they did good, but it was unrighteous. Mm -hmm. Because it was not after God's own mind. Amen. It was not after God's own. Any good works that's not according to God's own mind is evil works. It's actually not good. It's actually deceitful and dishonest. The Bible calls it filthy rags. Your righteousness, your good works is filthy rags. There can be no good works unless it has a, it comes, it's attended with a revelation of Jesus Christ. If we don't get a revelation of Jesus Christ, no good works will ever be good works. We must get a revelation of Jesus Christ in order for our good works to be accepted as good work. And this is what many people just don't seem, seem to understand. At the end, we, we just don't seem, seem to understand these things. That we cannot be good unless Christ reveals himself to us and reveals God to us. But Genesis 45 verse 3. I just want to take in something with presence. It's very important. Genesis 45. The next time you see presence in the Bible, here's what Christ, I don't know if that was the second time. But I'm only using it in Genesis. The Lord connects this to presence for a reason. Genesis 45, verse 3, please. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. What does presence do? Troubles you. It troubles you. What, was Adam and Eve troubled? Yes. Yeah, they were troubled. Mm -hmm. So why does Laodicea not come to the light? Something about the 2520 troubles them. Something yeah. troubles them. That's why they don't come to the light. It troubles them. Something about it scares them. The only reason why I went there is for this reason. That word presence, when you look it up, one of its meaning is face. Um, it's face. It's, it's, it's uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Face. Um, favor. It's fa it's fa it means a few things, but I'm, I just want to take the word face. Every time God reveals, his, reveals light to us, and, and light is a symbol of his presence. That's his face. We're seeing his face. To see this light is to get an un, a clear understanding. Whenever you get a clear understanding of truth, you're seeing God's face. That's what you're seeing. So this is why Jacob says, I've wrestled with God and I've seen his face and I what? Lived. I live. He was able to endure the unveiled presence of God. That's what Jacob was able to do. Is everyone following? The time of Jacob's trouble is an unveiled presence of God. A powerful light is going to be revealed to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And if we don't have oil in our vessels, we're going to drown in that revelation. We're going to drown. It's yeah, full of presence. meaning. Yeah, yes, presence yes. Of, it also means form, fear of. Um, yes. It means old, it means old time. Pray, yes, Pray. amen. It was a lot of things, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I could only take the ones for now. I'm God. looking at all these names. It means a lot. Amen. So Sorry. whenever, so every time God reveals His presence, Sweet. old time, Sugar. fear. Go ahead. What you say, Rashad? Um, yeah, it's it, it's the, His mouth, His anger. It means amen. Straight, straight showbread. It's a lot. Yes, and that's all those presents. Every yeah. time He reveals it, all those things apply. Every single last we one of them. The sanctuary. Every one of them. So when Michael stands up. It's an unveiled revelation of God, though, and it's going to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. 
It's going to everybody. And if we don't have oil in our vessels, we will not be able to endure like Jacob endured because Jacob had oil in his vessel with his lamp. As a prince, thou hast wrestled with God and prevailed. You prevail. Brethren, God is about to open up a powerful light before the civil Sunday law. And if we don't have oil in our vessels, we won't be able to endure this great wrestling. Mm. We just won't be able to endure. And if we don't understand that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is confined but yet not confined to the man who has his mind opened up to the understanding of God's word. If you have oil in the vessel with the lamp, God's word is not confined. If all you have is the lamp, God's word is confined. That's why you have to stop at the crisis. You stop at the crisis. But those who have oil is able to make it all the way to the marriage. In other words, they're able to prevail with God and enter into the marriage. The marriage is the blessing. Blessed are your eyes, for they do see the things that's taking place in heaven. Amen. Amen. That's what Christ wants us to see. To have your eyes open is to have the ability to see what's taking place, literally taking place in heaven. It's happening up there, but down here we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trouble down here. But the trouble down here is only a representation of what's taking place up there. That's all it is. It's only explaining what's taking place up there. Because at the National Sunday Law, the nations are going to marry the papacy. At the National Sunday Law, we're going to marry Christ. What's taking place down here is taking place up there. It's the same thing. And Christ wants us to be ready for that. But we have to have oil in our vessel. But we have to be able to endure the presence of God. Every time God's presence comes, it is trouble. It brings trouble when he reveals his presence. So there's a certain light. There's a certain light that, that no matter what, it has to bring trouble. There's a certain light that Christ always reveals. And whenever he does, it always brings trouble. It just always does. And it's connected to, want to know what one of it's connected to? Just go read Daniel 10. Go read Daniel 10. Go read it. What is Daniel 10 talking about? What is it talking about? I mean, it's talking about a lot of things. But what was Gabriel trying to show Daniel 10? What was he trying to show him there? Yes, but what was the conclusion of what he was trying to show him? Okay, and how is it going to end? Christ taking the kingdom. What prophecy in the Bible is talking about Christ receiving his kingdom? That always brings trouble. Yep. Always brings trouble. Anytime Leviticus 26 is preached, it always brings trouble. More trouble than the 2300 days. The 2300 days also brings trouble. It took Daniel had to fast to get the answer to the 2300 days. But the one that brings the most trouble is a prophecy that teaches you how Christ receives the kingdom. I wonder That's the one that brings the most I trouble. I got a thought. Go ahead. It means... This, this is where it's important to understand the warfare between Christ and Satan. And that's what because that's about. Because it's Amen. Satan that is troubled. Amen. And this yes, is what you need to see. Yes, Amen. it says, until he comes whose right, right is. it Amen. is. Amen. Satan fears that. Amen. Because he knows ones that he knoweth what he had but a short time. What does he see in that? His end. Yes, he sees his end. He sees his end. His kingdom is coming to a what? End. Why? Because it's the time of the what? End. And go read what Ellen White says about the time of the end. She says it's the time of the end of evil. The, time, the long reign of evil is come to its end. And the prophecy that teaches you how the long reign of evil come to its end, Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. Then what does the 23rd of days teach you? This is where people get things wrong. This is where people get a lot of things wrong concerning the gospel. Can you go to the next one? Jump over voice. Um... His voice and then the call. You had I read the call. Yeah. We're going to jump over that. Um, and law and the gospel. This, this is what people get wrong. Right, this one I'll quote. Genesis 2. This, this we're familiar. We're all familiar with because this is, this is, as Rashad said, this is our first parents. And our first parents was under law. They were under law. And the law that they were under, and the Lord God commanded the man. That's it. The Lord commanded the man. That's the law they were under. God commanded the man. And that was designed to show Adam that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. That's what that was to show Adam. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. Even though you're a king, you're still subject to my law. Adam was supposed to understand that and pass that on to his, his, his posterities. That's what he was supposed to do. Adam is Nebuchadnezzar. That's who he is. He's Nebuchadnezzar. But like Nebuchadnezzar, he lifted himself up and he ate that fruit. That's what he did. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, he did the same thing. And the Lord did what? 
The same thing he did to Nebuchadnezzar. He humbled the human family for 7,000 years. Amen. Is everyone following? Yeah. The human family must be humbled for 7,000 years. We must be humbled until we come out of the dust. Until we come out, and at the end of the 7,000 years, an excellent reason and majesty is going to return onto the human family. Because that's what Nebuchadnezzar is showing us. At the end of 7,000 years, at the end, a wonderful revelation is going to come to the human family as something came to Nebuchadnezzar. Is everyone following? All right, so Adam was humbled because Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. Because Nebuchadnezzar ate, Adam ate a fruit, Nebuchadnezzar ate a fruit. It's the same thing. Nebuchadnezzar broke the commandment. That's what he did. Adam broke the commandment, and man needed to be humbled for breaking the commandment. Okay, that's what man was given. All man had to do was obey the commandment. There was no need for a gospel. There was no need for a gospel. Man needed to obey the commandment. The law was written upon man's heart, and all he had to do was walk in the light of what was written upon his conscience. That's all he had to do. That's all he had to do. But Adam and Eve allowed their conscience to be what? Misguided. They allowed it to be misguided. How did they allow it to be misguided? This is where we're going. A shepherd. They allowed another shepherd, other than Christ, to teach them about the law. That's what they did. They allowed an enemy to come and sow something into their mind that allowed their consciences to become confused. That's what they did. They, be, they Adam and Eve became the first drunkards in the human history. They were the first drunks. That's what they were, the first drunks upon this planet. They received a false understanding of God's law, and it caused them to fall. And in this fall, Christ could have left them in their helpless state. But Christ didn't leave us in our helpless state. Christ says, as I said earlier with Abigail, this sin God be upon me. Make me the drunkard and make them sober. Make me drunk and make them sober. And what did Jesus become? He became drunk. Jesus staggered in Gethsemane and he fell. Is everyone following? He took upon him the poisonous things of the serpent. But Jesus is the only one that can drink alcohol and still be sober. Is everyone following? Amen. Because he's God. He's the only one that can drink all that poison from the venom of Satan and still be sober. The Bible says he became drunk for us. He became sin for us. Sin ran through him, but it didn't corrupt him. It didn't corrupt him. It can't. It, it, why? Because he's healthy. Because he's God. Yeah. He's God. It the cannot corrupt. So what healthy, is he teaching he us? If we don't have the divine nature in us, when the, when the high priest casts all the sins upon the scapegoat, we're going to be drunk and we're going to die if we don't have Christ's divine nature. Is everyone following we have to pass through the same experience that Jesus passed through in Gethsemane. We're going to have to pass through it too. We're going to have to pass through this experience. And God is trying to get us ready for these, get us ready for these things. Go back to the point. Adam and Eve became drunk and, and they now, they fell. But instead of leaving them in their drunken state, because they thought fig leaves could, could cover them. They were, they were drunk. This is why they covered themselves with fig leaves. But Jesus came to make them sober. And what Jesus gave them to make them sober was the gospel. This is what he gave them. The gospel makes men reasonable. That's what the gospel does. The gospel, when it's preached correctly, it makes you reasonable. Notice what I said, when it's preached correctly. It was, a, it was a shepherd that caused Adam and Eve to fall, so it has to be a shepherd that recovers them from their fall. Is everyone following? A shepherd caused their fall, well, a shepherd must recover them from their fall. A serpent caused their... A serpent... That became a serpent that became a medium for Satan caused their fall. Well, a serpent that became a medium for God recovers them from their fall. A serpent was taken over by Satan. Well, a human was taken over by God to recover us from a fall. Jesus had to undo what was done to them. And he's doing it the same way to bring us back to God. The same way. So as you go on and you follow and you follow this story, where are we trying to get? How much time do I have left? 15 minutes, thank you. And you follow this story. I'm going to go into the next part now soon. And you follow this story and you come down. Adam, as I said, Adam and Eve fell. Um, what was the thought that was going with that? Adam and Eve, the shepherd. Um, Christ, yes, that's it, the law and the gospel. Is that Adam was, all Adam had to do was obey. But now because Adam and Eve sinned, they had to obey something else. They now had to obey the gospel. That's what I want to get to. They had to obey the gospel. 
The whole point of the Jewish economy was to teach us about the fall of man and the recovery of man. That was the purpose of the Jewish economy, to teach us the gospel. Ellen White says it was the gospel in miniature. That's what the Jewish economy is. What am I getting to that? The Lord formed the Jewish people and he placed them in a land eastward. He placed them in, 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 in Canaan. That's what he did. And all they had to do was take care of the land in which they went into. And the Lord God commanded the Jewish nation. And he says, when you go into the land, see that you reverence my Sabbath, you reverence my sanctuary. And what was the other one? Um, no, no images. And no image. Don't set up no image in that. That's all the law they had to keep. Yeah. That's all the law they had to keep. The same law Adam had to keep, they had to keep. And they were to be fruitful and do what? Multiply, Multiply and replenish the earth. That's what they were supposed to do. In other words, what I'm trying to say, God is just repeating the Garden of Eden over and over and over and over and over and over. And the last nation that gets to fulfill this rep repetition of history is what? The United States of America. The United States of America is the last piece of land that has an opportunity to, to fulfill God's purposes. But unfortunately, it's, 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 it, it's, it's not. It's not going to happen. 1989 ensures us that it's not going to happen. That's what 1989, it ensures us that it's not going to happen. <laughs> but the whole point is, the Jewish nation, they were given a law. Now, if I were to ask this, were they supposed to rebuild the sanctuary? Yes. No, no, they weren't. No, they weren't. It wasn't, say it again, was Adam supposed to be reformed? No. He wasn't supposed to be what? Destroyed in the first place. He was supposed to keep what? Keep growing. So the Jewish nation, amen, was supposed to keep growing. But what happened to the Jewish nation? They forgot. What happened to Adam? <laughs> he forgot. They repeated the same thing. Mm -hmm. What caused Adam to forget? The woman. What caused the Jewish nation to forget? Religion. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. That's the, that's the whole point. That's what I was saying earlier with Manasseh. It's the same thing. It's the religion that caused Manasseh to forget. It's the religion that caused Manasseh to corrupt himself. As a result, the whole point of what I'm getting to, when you go back to Leviticus 26, God says, if you continue in rebellion, yeah. I'm going to destroy your sanctuary and your, cities. and your city. That's what I'm going to do. Did they continue in their rebellion? Yes. So did God fulfill his promise? Yes. yes, he did. But what did God say? even though he destroyed a city and sanctuary. If you humble yourself, yep. and if you repent, yep. I will rebuild. Accept the punishment. And, yes, and accept, yes, that part is most important. And accept the punishment. I will rebuild your sanctuary, and I will rebuild your city. Mm -hmm. Did God send a builder? Yep. Who was the builder? Cyrus. Cyrus. He sent Cyrus. He sent Cyrus the Christ. shepherd. Because he sent who? Christ. Amen. You know what Leviticus 26 says? I learned this one from Miller, and I really love it. And, and the reason why I love it, we have Reformation terribly wrong. A lot of people have Reformation terribly wrong. When you read Leviticus 20, you know what Leviticus 26 is all about? Reformation. That's what Leviticus Amen. 26 is about. How to get Reformation. restored to the How covenant. How to get restored again to the covenant. Mm -hmm. You cannot be restored to a covenant that you don't know. So wait a minute. So you mean Seventh-day Adventists can't be reformed if they don't know this covenant? Nope. Yes, Seventh-day Adventists can't Neither be reformed the unless they know States. this covenant. Neither do you. Nobody, matter of fact, nobody. We cannot be reformed unless we know the covenant of Leviticus 26. That covenant of Leviticus 26 is a covenant. The Jewish nation, God made a covenant with them. God put that story in the Bible to teach us of the covenant that he made with Adam. Amen. That's what he did. That's there to teach us there's a covenant that God made with Adam, and we are privileged to know of the covenant through the Jewish nation. We're privileged to know of it through the Jewish people. And if we receive the covenant made with Adam, then we're privileged. Blessed are your eyes if you can see the covenant made between the Amen. Father and the Son. The covenant between Christ and Adam is really the covenant between the Father and the Son. Amen. And if your eyes can see past the natural and go up to the spiritual, your eyes are truly blessed. You can see that Christ made a covenant with God on how to get this land. That's what he did. Brethren, we're living the fulfillment of a promise that Christ made with the Father years ago. Years ago. 2024 is a promise. Christ promised this year would be here. 2025 is a promise. Christ promised this year would be here. 2020 was a promise. COVID was a promise. The World War II was a promise. World War I was a promise. Anything that happened to this earth is based upon a promise between the Father and the Son of the events that will transpire in this earth in this time of sin. Is everyone following? 
It's all based upon a promise. And at the end of this warfare with sin, God promised Christ you're going to get the land. Yes, you're going to get the land. You're going to get the land at the end of this warfare. And that's why at the end, Michael stands up to fulfill the promise, to get the land, to get the land. He stands up. And if we don't understand Michael, we won't stand with him. Rather, we will sink in the water because we have no oil in our vessels with our lands. Is, is everyone following? Amen. Praise God. So as you go on, so the Jewish nation is just a school. They're just there to teach us about the plan of salvation. Okay, so what covenant did the Jewish nation break? Leviticus 26. Yes. They broke that covenant. So God destroyed their sanctuary. And what did God say? If This is the part. If you will not be reformed by me, by all, by all these things. Why is God saying that? I wanted to look up reform, but I don't have that opportunity to look up the meaning of the word reform. Because I'm sure it means wonderful things. God says, if you will not be reformed. What is he telling the Jewish nation? He's reminding them of the beginning. In the beginning, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground. If you will not be reformed by me, by the dust of Babylon, Medan, Persia, Greece, and Rome, you will not enter into the kingdom. The dust of the ground was now the nations that was going to humble the Jewish people. They had to be reformed by these dust. Is everyone following? Amen. God made man of the dust of the ground. And if we want to be healed, we have to pass through these nations. That's what the Lord was telling the Jewish people. Reformation didn't come after a little while when you go through Leviticus 26. Manasseh already broke the covenant. Now God needed to reform them, but the reformation that they needed was to pass through these nations. It was to pass through these nations. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean for us at the end of the world? How are we reformed by these things? Seek ye the old path, when is the good way, and walk therein, and you will find reformation onto your soul. All who don't go back to the old path and understand what they had to pass through, they will not be reformed by God. Is everyone following? Amen. The Bible says, remember the former things of old, for I am God. Whoever don't want to remember the 2520 will not be reformed. But God has to, God formed man in the beginning, and God must reform man after the fall. The same God that formed us must also reform us, Amen. but we must be willing to be reformed by the things he chooses to use to reform us. And Leviticus 26 and the prophecies of 2520 is one of the means by which God has chosen to reform man by. One of the things I've learned from studying Leviticus 26 is that it teaches me how to reason. That's what it does. So one of the first thing about reforming man is reforming his ability to reason. Because the first thing man lost was his ability to reason. So the first thing that must be reformed is his ability to reason. Isaiah chapter 1. Amen. Come and let us what? Reason together. The first thing Adam and Eve lost was reason. So the first thing we must get back is our reason. Because you can't progress any further unless your reason is restored. You can't go any further. The Leviticus 26 is literally designed by God to heal our reason. The studying of that prophecy literally heals your reason. It literally does. It teaches you how to study the Bible. You cannot arrive at an understanding of the 2520 by simply reading Leviticus 26. You are forced to go to Jeremiah and learn how Manasseh did it. You're forced to go to Chronos. You're forced to go to different texts of the scriptures. And as you're doing that, your reason, excellent majesty and reason is being added, added back to you. You're being reformed. How do I know this is true? Because at the end of the seven times in 1798, God gave William Miller excellent majesty, oh, his reason. Yes, reason was added back to William Miller. He no longer was a deus anymore. He was now a worshiper of the true and living God. And at the end of the second 2520, reason restored onto them what? They were now worshipers of the true God on the seventh day Sabbath. Amen. And they had a proper understanding of the sanctuary. So at both seven times, 1790 and October 22nd, 1844, reason was restored to man um, at, at the end of those, those times. And I'm all out of time, right? Yeah, five, minutes. five minutes. All right, I'm going to go on to the second part of the note using these five minutes um, to go in. And just go down with me now to one. 
and, and we're going to stop around here. John 17, this one. And Jesus prayed this prayer. And he says, Father, I, I pray that they will be one as we are one. And, he, and Jesus asked for the glory that he had with the Father. And this whole prayer of Christ was about being one. That This whole prayer was about being one with God and one with his people. Just go through this entire prayer. And he says, it's the glory of God to be one. When the whole earth is lightened with God's glory, it's because he has one fold and one shepherd. That's what's going to cause this whole earth to be lightened with God's glory. We're going to be Praise one. God. We're going to have a proper understanding of what it means to be a head and a body. If we don't have a proper understanding of what it means to be a head and a body, we cannot be reformed. And we cannot give God glory. You know, Amen. God has to set up an organization with people that has a proper knowledge of how to be a head and a body. And, go ahead. I like that thought, Kenan. This is why the first angel's message should have, could have come. Because the Lord had a United States. And yes, that's, that's the seven times. Yes. Excellent majesty was added. Yeah, that's why that can happen. The Amen. Till they somebody. were one. Yeah. Amen. Oneness brings the true understanding of the first, second, and third angel's mess. That's Amen. what Swindon is saying. And the civil war took it away. Amen. Ah, yes. That's nice. Yeah. I, I really, the Lord really wants us to understand this oneness of head and body. And yes. we're going to read some things concerning this. And I pray that we rightly understand this. I, by God's grace, I'm asking the Lord, help me not to be ashamed of saying certain things or being afraid of people's faces. Thank God I can't see faces, so I'm not really troubled by that so much. But I say, and I say, Lord, help me not to be afraid of teaching, because I realize that, um, for, um, please understand me when I say this, the brother who left, Satan is using him to fight against government. Um, my, the people who left this movement, Satan is using them to fight against. Every attack on this message is just to fight against us from being one. Every single attack Amen. is just designed by Satan to prevent us from being one. And one of his most subtle attacks that he does, I will go to God for myself. Nonsense. No man can come to God, Jesus says, except they come through me. You must first go through a man before you can come to God. That's how he says you're reformed. You must be formed from the dust first, and then I will breathe into you. Amen. You must allow man to form you by a correct understanding, and then I will speak to you. If you don't allow man to speak to you in whom you can see, how do you think you're going to understand me when I speak to you whom you can't see? Tremble and run. How are you going to understand me if you can't understand the man that's speaking to you whom you can't see? How can you receive the spiritual understanding when you can't receive the natural understanding that you can see? Amen. You can see the natural sunlight, but you think you're ready to see the spiritual sunlight? You can't even receive the natural 2520 of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. You think you're ready to receive the spiritual understanding of the 2520? Mm. There's a very deep, profound understanding of the 2520. But if we don't receive the first one, we can't get the second one. And I want to say there's a third one because there's three heavens. It's not two heavens. It's three heavens. There's three revelations to every vision because that's our lip. Reg, I really want us to understand this. God only give man just three steps. We can't manage any more in this life. He just gives us three steps to get to heaven. When we get to heaven... It's a boundless, seamless show. The steps never end. But what man can by search and find out God? You can never find out God. You can only find out what he chooses to reveal to you. But as long as we're in this earth, God only requires of man three steps. Just the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And if we can climb these three steps and we make it to heaven, oh, what a glorious revelation man is going to get. Because man now has a mind to take on eternal things more than he really could have in this life. But God just gave us a starting point in this life. Three steps. So if we can't receive these simple natural truths he's given to us, we're not going to be able to endure the light that's coming at the midnight cry going forward. We're just not going to be able to endure it. And the Lord is trying to bring us to a place where we appreciate it. So we're going to go now to understand a little better head and body. And I know uh, I, I just ask God to give me grace. To say these things to my best ability, because I know no matter what I say, they're going to say, one, you're lifting yourself up. Two, all this garbage, you're, 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 you're telling people to follow you and worship you and all this foolishness that, that, that people are going to say. But if we, if we allow the word of God to define for us 
the true understanding of having a government, then we will be okay. Mm. We'll be okay by God's grace. And if, because if we're not a true government, God cannot breathe life into us. Mm. First, he formed Adam. What did he form? He formed a head and a mm -hmm. body. And after he formed the head and the body, the God breathed into that body. So the Lord is teaching us how the last movement is to be at the end of the world. They must have a head and a body before he breathes into them. They must have a head and a body before they, he breathes into them. Amen. Go ahead. Um, it was because Eve went to try to find God by herself that yes, she amen. fell amen. and yep. caused Adam to fall. So Neron, that's really nice. That's really nice. If you, leave, if you leave to try to find God by yourself, you're going to what? Fall. fall. What did she leave? What she left? She left the head. She, she didn't want to listen to her shepherd anymore. Amen. She didn't want to hear her shepherd. She thought she can be the what? Shepherd. shepherd. Yeah, but wait a minute. She left her shepherd to go listen to a what? Another shepherd. You hypocrite. <laughs> you hypocrite. You left the shepherd to go listen to another shepherd? Because that shepherd was commanding his household after me to keep the way. You know, when you read that, it doesn't say after God. When you read that with Abraham, I thought it did, but that's not what it says. It says, I know him. He shall command his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. That's what it actually says. Go read that text. I said, man, Abraham, Abraham's duty was to make sure the house keeps the way of the Lord. The general conference was set up to make sure this yeah. church stays in the way of the Lord. Amen. That was the shepherd's responsibility. Amen. Make sure the household keeps the way of the Lord. Make sure they keep it. That was Adam's duty. But the shepherd can't stop you if you say, I no longer want to be in the way. He can't stop you. What does Jesus say? What thou doest, do quickly. You don't want to be ruled. What does it say? We will not have this man to rule over us. We will not have this pastor to rule over us. That's what Eve says in the garden. That's what she says. I will not have Adam to rule over me. And therefore, by default, what is she saying? I will not have God to rule over me. And she went to go have who? The serpent rule. You hypocrite. You left one ruler to go to another ruler? So wait a minute. So what is everyone going to do at the end of the world? They're going to leave one pastor to go to the Pope. They're going to leave one pastor and go have the Pope rule over them. What a bunch of hypocrites. What a bunch of hypocrites. You don't want Christ to rule over you, but you're going to have the Pope rule over you? How do I know this is true? We have no ruler, but who? Caesar. So that story is in the Bible to show us that the general conference is literally going to say one day, we have no pope, but the papacy. They're really going to say that. At, at the same, They're really going to say that. Go at ahead. the same time, Kennard, there is the opposite of that, where you're supposed to leave one shepherd for the true shepherd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. The people sitting under these false rulers... They have to say that. I Amen. don't want that shepherd. I want the true shepherd. So the Amen. opposite is also true. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, and them too, I must bring. Amen. They have to leave one bad shepherd and come where? To the good shepherd. But the only way they're going to do that is if they know his voice. Amen. If you don't know his voice, it is, I'm, as God has helped me to understand is the more I see how, the more sad you feel, when you see people following the Pope, that's sad, man. That is very sad. They're following him because they think that man is a worshiper of God. It's a sad thing to see people follow Bishop T.D. Jakes because they think that man is a worshiper of God. But it is more sad to see people follow Ted Wilson because they think that man is a worshiper of God. It is more sad. And it is more sad to see people follow Mark Bruce because they think that man is a worshiper of God. And it's even more sad if any one of us is pretending to be a worshiper of God and have people following us. Is everyone following? The, knowing the voice of God is extremely important. I'm going to take your hand. I just want to say this one thing. The message to Laodicea, you know what their condition, their real problem is? 
they don't know the voice of God. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Who's knocking? Who's knocking? But well, who's, who's representing Christ doing the knocking? The pastor. How shall they knock except there be a preacher? The knocking is the gospel call. Every time we preach the first, second, and third angel's message, Christ is knocking at the door. And he says, if any man hears my voice through these pastors and open up their door of their heart and receiving the message in which they preach, I will come in and finally talk to you in place of those pastors. But if you don't open the door, don't expect me to talk to you because you won't even open the door to my pastors talking to you. So it makes you think, I, you're not letting them in your house, so it makes you think I will come in your house. They represent me. You let them in, you've let me in. Isn't that what Christ says? If they receive you, they receive me. If they receive me, they receive him that sent me. That's what Christ said. We have to receive the pastors. Pastors have one of the most important places in the gospel work. One of the most important places. Every one of us have an important place, but ministers have a very important place in the work of the gospel. Amen. Go ahead the hand, and then we'll close with prayer. I was just seeing an example of Adam and Eve playing up in our own church. Um, Say it again. I was just seeing an example of Adam and Eve playing, up, playing out in our church. Yes, As amen. far as the shepherd and the, um, and the body. Yeah, the body, you know, Amen. I was just looking at um, the ones who just left recently, you know, as far as, you know. What are they they're doing? What Eve did, right? As far as Eve, you know, Eve yeah. trying to be in control and leading the shepherd the wrong direction and, and the shepherd listening to Eve. And then what happens is the shepherd falls even harder. And once he falls, the whole family falls completely. The whole family falls. The whole you house know? suffers. And so what's going to happen to America? Same thing. The same thing. When you reject that call, though, it means that the shepherd goes higher. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. When the shepherd rejects Eve's advances, Amen, that's nice. goes higher. Well, how and, high does and he if go? You look back and if all... I be lifted up, I will draw all men yes. onto me. And you got to go to the cross. I like, I like that too. To because if you, if you look at the prior, the prior scenario of the situation that happened, prior when the shepherd was not listening to who, to, uh, to the body, you know, and was, was standing up for truth, um, it did make a difference. You know, the, the family was actually coming come back to church. But once yeah, the shepherd, once the shepherd um, decided to follow his wife's the whole footsteps, house falls. then completely, you see, you complete fall, and it's hard to get him back. And so he's completely gone. So then what is that telling you then, uh, as the body is supposed to do for the ministers? Pray for your ministers. Amen. Pray for your ministers. Because women is a, oh man, if Huge Satan influence. can get control of the, the wife, if he, it's a battle for the ministers. And I, and trust me, it, it's a serious battle for the Ooh. ministers. I mean, if Adam fell for it, it's easy for any man to fall for it. Amen. So, so many people that has been in this movement, so many ministers that has been in this movement, and they left because of their wives. And that always scared me. Literally, it always scared me. It's and I remember one of them. I remember one of them. And, I, and I don't, I'm not going to put their business out there, put their marriage business out there. But I remember one of them very well. And I'm like, Lord, please, by your grace, don't let that happen to me. I watched his wife. I remember one brother, one brother I witnessed to in, in, in Brooklyn. And, and I don't remember the name. of It's not Brooklyn Faith. It was this Maranatha. It was Maranatha. And I loved that brother and, and his wife. They, they were, I was really good friends with his wife. And I'll never forget the day I, I, I was talking to him and he was accepting the truth. And he allowed his wife to sway him. That terror. I was like, my goodness, you saw the light in this. And because your wife didn't want to walk in the light, you chose to listen to her. And I, and I just watched Adam and Eve being fulfilled right in front of my face. Mm -hmm. Watch it being fulfilled right in front of my face. And he walked away from this light because his wife didn't want to walk in the light. And I, I, the reason why I thank God for this experience, because they become a beacon to me. And I'm like, Lord, whatever light you give me, that my spouse don't want to accept, give me grace to go a little higher. Give me grace to walk in this light no matter what. Even if it means I'm going to have my beard plucked out and my face spit up on and my face covered so she can slap me in the face, give me grace to go on. And these are the things that encourage me by his grace to keep walking. That no matter, because the wife also represents the congregation. She represents the congregation. So whoever in the congregation don't want to accept it, Lord, give me grace to keep going forward. 
because it's also the body. Because many pastors reject this message because the congregation didn't want to accept it. Is everyone following? Yeah. They, because the congregation didn't want to walk in it, they don't want to walk in it. And that's it. the same thing is just happening again and again and again and again and again and again. And your only safety for it is love for the truth. That's your only safety. You have to love, receive the truth and the love of it and ask God to, to give you grace to rise above all these difficulties. You know, rise above, rise above the water, float on the water, and don't, don't drown in the water of persuasion of lies to draw you away from the truth. Shall we close our prayer? Heavenly Father, I really pray, O oh Lord, that these things were understood this morning. I, I, I hope that the lesson was learned, O oh Lord, that the whole scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. Every story in the Bible is, 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 is at our hands to understand the things taking place in this world. But Father, without the Holy Spirit, the, the, the one who, who gave the prophecy, we can't understand these things. And Lord, if there was anything that was said that, that was confusing to anybody, Father, help them not to, to be bothered by these things, but to trust and to know that the Holy Spirit is in us. And anything that, that perplexes the mind, all we have to do is come to you and ask you to clarify it and, and to open these things up to us. We must learn to deal with difficult matters, O oh Lord, so because there's a difficult um, time ahead of us. And, and passing through these things is only preparing us and training us to deal with the difficult, the hard sayings of your word. So please, O oh Lord, help us to, to, to understand these things. Please continue to be with us. Help anything that was learned this morning not to slip from the mind. Lord, your Holy Spirit accompanies the preaching. And we really pray, and I really pray that your Holy Spirit accompany the preaching this morning. And, and as we continue on with the next presentation, prepare our hearts to receive the things that will be said. And, and I pray that all of us will join in the preaching as well, that we will share that which was, that was made clear to our minds so that we all can, can feast upon the, the flesh and blood of the Son of the living God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.